Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first talk of the academic year. We're the Cambridge University Scientific Society, and we're a student-run society running weekly talks across a variety of scientific disciplines. We are very happy to welcome Dr. Buzz Baum as our first speaker for the year. Dr. Baum studied biochemistry in Oxford as an undergraduate before completing his PhD at the lab of Sir Paul Nurse, where he studied the timing of the cell division cycle in fission yeast. He went on to do a postdoc with Professor Norbert Perryman at Harvard Medical School, studying morphogenesis in flies and fly cells to examine the influence of cell shape. Dr. Baum set up his own lab in 2001 at UCL, pioneering high throughput genetics in cell systems to investigate the control of cell shape in animal cells during development and cell division. He was appointed professor of cell biology in 2011, and in 2020, Dr. Baum moved his group to the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge to continue work on cell growth and division in archaea as a model for the evolution of complex cells. Today, Dr. Baum will talk about his work investigating the cell biology of archaea and the insights we can bring from this to our own cell biology. Everyone, let's put our hands together for Dr. Buzz Baum. Thank you. Thanks, Trish, for a beautifully uh, <laughs> delivered introduction. Yeah, so, um, well, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I actually looked at some of the other talks on the, on the Chemistry Science Society uh, website, and it was um, really great um, speakers, so I'm very honored to be invited to give a talk. Um, feel free to interrupt along the way if you'd like to, but I'll tell you a sort of story, and at the end we can also discuss. So um, I'm going to try and keep it general because I know there's a mixed audience. So I'm beginning. This is not space, actually. This is sulfalobus under a microscope where we're imagining what we can see, like constellations. But the let's see if this is going to work. For some reason. So, um, but the title of my talk, yeah, is In Search of Our Archaea Origins. So we're going to talk about where complex cells and complex organisms like us come from. So um, looking from space, you can see uh, this beautiful planet Earth. And uh, I've always been interested um, in, in my family. There are, we're, diff we're four brothers. So Josh, the number two, got space and I got Earth. Um, but I was happy with that because, as we know, life on Earth... Oh, Okay, there is the whole talk. You're going to... Okay, I'm not doing very well. Okay, let's go back. Because okay, it's not doing... Okay. So, Earth is a beautiful place. And when you go for a walk uh, in the woods or in a forest, what you see are the organisms that are made from complex cells, eukaryotic cells. And, um, and so one can ask the question, uh, how did it all get to be here? And people have done that throughout the ages. People have thought about, you know, where did um, life come from? And religious people have thought about that. But also scientists. Um, Owen Schrodinger wrote this very brilliant book called What Is Life? Thinking About What Life um, Could Be Made Of. And I think it's really useful as a biologist um, to also begin thinking simply about life. Um, and so... Uh, contemplating, you know, as a scientist, we're often, as kids, we become scientists, I think, and we need to sort of look at the world and ask questions of the world. And so that's sort of what this is demonstrating. And as you know, thinking about apples or watching them fall is, at least as legend has it, how Newton started thinking about gravity. So we can also look at nature and just simple things sometimes can give us profound insights. And I think actually looking at apple is a good place um, to start. And lots of people, of course, have looked at apples very carefully. Cezanne has some of the most beautiful apples that I uh, have ever seen. Um, and there's always been a question about how does nature work? How does life work? Which is an old question that people have always been interested in, what lies beneath. And if you cut open an apple, of course, you see that in the center there are apple pips. And, of course, that's trivial. We all know that. Um, as a kid, I was always afraid of eating pips because the pips I knew could form apple trees which kind of freaked me out. And in a way, that's what's amazing about an apple, is that in every apple, there's a pip which can make an apple tree, which can make an apple which has pips in it, and it goes on. And in fact, the lineage from these apple trees, of course, goes four billion years back in time to the beginning of life on Earth. So every organism alive today is connected through seeds, germline, to 
the origins of all life. So we can do a lot by thinking about uh, looking carefully just at ordinary living things like an apple. Um, but of course, because living things are, the machinery of life is small, in order to really uh, get at that, you need to use glass lenses. I've got a friend actually wrote a book on material science, and he was saying that one of the things in China, they were very good at making porcelain. So they didn't work on glass, which is why they didn't invent the microscope and telescope before us, even though they invented almost everything else. Um, so in Europe, though, glass um, handling enabled us to build lenses and early microscopes. And as you will know, one of the first people to look down the microscope at living tissue was this guy, Hook. Leeuwenhoek also, in, also looked down microscopes early to see stuff. And what he saw is that he saw tissue is made into these little compartments, which reminded him of monastic cells, so he called them cells. And this is just a beautiful picture from one of the most brilliant cell biologists of all time, Theodore Bovary, of an early embryo. So what we do is, down a microscope, you can start to get closer to really the essence of what living things are. And that's what we want to do as scientists. So um, as I've already said, you can get some clues just at the macroscopic scale from apples come pips and from pips apples. Um, you also know, uh, as people did before, that uh, if you want to make a Bach, you need another Bach. And uh, this is a map of the, the musical talent in the Bach family. Um, this is uh, maybe the standout genius, but there are other brilliant uh, musicians amongst them. So we know that, again, living things inherit stuff from previous generations, which is what's important about life. And in the 1800s, actually, we also learned really two profound things about life. That, first of all, um, life comes from life. So Louis Pasteur repeated experiments people had done for a long time to try to see if you could get life from nothing. Of course, once upon a time it happened, there was nothing and then there was life. So it's possible. It had to happen for there to be life. But, of course, in nowadays, if you want to get living things, and he made these uh, swan-necked uh, glass vials to show that if you heated this and sterilized it and it had a neck this shape, it would never become contaminated because dust that might contain microbes would fall here and would get stuck. And so this would stay fresh without um, leaving it just on a bench. And in, if you go to the Pasteur Museum in Paris, you can see some of these original flasks that he had. So he showed that all life comes from life. And in fact, also in a similar time in the 1850s, people realized that cells come from cells. So if you want to make a cell, what you need to do is have another cell, which would give rise to two daughter cells. So people were thinking about the lineage. Um, and one thing that we also learned from the Bachs, not just about genetics, we also learned about this idea that you can start simple, and by building on a few, you can get more and more complicated. So there was an idea around that f complexity has its origins in simplicity. And the person who really understood that, of course, at a similar time in the 1800s to um, Pasteur and Remack and others, was Charles Darwin. And, and after doing his young expeditions where he explored the world and looked at things like the beaks of finches, what he thought about, and this we know um, from his notebooks, we know that he was thinking because he wrote the words, I think, in his notebook. So anybody taking notes, I would encourage you to write, I think, in your notebook, because then in the future people would say, this person was really thinking. So he wrote, I think, and what we think he was thinking about is that once upon a time there was life, which gave rise to this branching tree through descent with modification, through things inheriting things from previous generations, but changing it, and then through selection, getting all these different kinds of organisms like A, B, C, D, living today that would have common ancestor. And so this thing in his notebook is really a revolution because he's thinking about once upon a time there was one organism that gave rise to all of life on Earth. And we now know that's true. Like everything on Earth today is the progeny of this one event, this, um, sorry, I shouldn't say one event, where you have one common ancestor. There might have been lots of models, but only one model successfully populated the whole world. And people think that this is a one because it's the origin. But actually, I like to think it's a cell with two chromosomes and a spindle because we now know that all of life on Earth descent from a cell that grew and divided, grew and divided, grew and divided. That's the history of life on Earth. So we're all really a colony a colony of cells. That really is what the, the life on Earth is like. And this is what a modern picture of the history of life on Earth looks like. So there's all this primordial soup stuff going along, 
happening. And then some, some time, maybe three and a half billion years ago around, there was the last universal common ancestor of all life, this cell, number one, which Darwin thought about. And this gave rise to two branches on the tree of life, the bacterial branch and the archaeal branch. And as we learned you know, at university, maybe you're still learning about that, that you know, we learned about evolution working through survival of the fittest, things compete. But one thing that Darwin really got wrong in his tree, which you can, I'm still having trouble with this, um, is this, that all complex cells arose not from competition between lineages, but the merger of an archaeal lineage with a bacterial lineage to give rise to complex cells, which is everything you see when you walk in the woods, every big thing, plants, animals, fungi, all those things arose from a coming together of two organisms to make a super organism, a super cell that gave rise to all these multicellular organisms through again coming together. So, um, and in fact, uh, another depiction I, uh, which I quite like, uh, it, it really shows that all the different events where cells have come together to give rise to other things. And of course, as you know, plants are plants because they also got cyanobacteria were engulfed. That's also true in, um, in algae and things that essentially another uh, cell swallowed one to give rise to plants. A cyanobacteria which could photosynthesize, that was taken up and then plants arose on this tree. So this is this branch here as well. So there's a lot of entanglement and it's much more interesting than just this linear um, sort of thing where things are fighting, competing. The history of life on Earth is, is, is a bit more complicated than that. Um, so one can sort of, uh, although we often learn about evolution as about, you know, alleles competing in a population, giving rise to um, a fit of, pop, you know, pop, uh, individuals in populations that change over time. Um, and we always think about survival of the fittest as how it works. That's really only part of the story. When you look at the history of life on Earth, it isn't, uh, that isn't a good description. And one thing that's really uh, missing from many of those discussions is the thing that Darwin evolution doesn't do, which Darwin knew it didn't do, is it doesn't make complexity. You don't get simple things from survival of the fittest by competition between um, um, organisms that are slightly different in the same niche. What you often get is simplicity. That's why when a venture capitalist takes over a company and wants to make more money, they often strip it bare. And that's what evolution often does. If you, if you a parasite to get better and better at sucking your blood will often get stripped down simpler and simpler and more efficient at doing what it has to do, which is suck your blood. So that is what often survival of the fittest will do. But what it won't do is give you this um, complexity that we as biologists love in nature. Um, so what are the origins of biological complexity? So this is my um, simple picture of it. By the way, when we're in discussion, please argue with me if you think you, uh, think you don't buy it. But essentially, um, once upon a time on Earth, there was primordial soup, where there was probably chemical reactions that form. So of course, each chemical in a soup will have a fleeting existence. But if you get a, a loop with a positive feedback cycle, you can get autocatalytic auto cycle, where a set of chemicals will survive persist for longer because they make each other. So you could look at that as a set of individuals helping to make each other, kind of a society of chemicals. Then, of course, in parallel, there must have been self-replication. People think that RNA must have been the thing at the base of self-replication because RNA is a nucleic acid like those found in cells today, which can both form a polymer, which can store information, and an enzyme which can do stuff. So then you have a, a, an enzyme that can maybe make itself to generate uh, self-replicating molecules, like selfish genes. These are real selfish genes. But even then, you have to remember that a catalytic RNA that's making other RNA, to make itself, it has to make a template strand, a, a complementary strand, which then will make it back. So even then, it's a community of plus and minus strands that are giving rise to self-replication. It's not one thing alone. Then something special happens, and all these things, like chemistry and self-replicating molecules and a lipid membrane had to come together in some way to make this amazing thing that is the unit of life, which is the cell, which is a collective, it's a consortium of lots of chemistry, self-replicating molecules, a lipid membrane working together so that the cell is either successful or not successful as a whole. So all the chemistry inside a cell, essentially everything is, is, is working in order that the whole collective is successful. And so evolution is operating at the level 
of the cell. And then a bit later in evolution we were discussing, you get cells coming together to form cells within cells. And again, the complex cell then is, the, is where selection acts to, uh, to, to choose who's fitter, not to the individual parts of a cell, which might be, you know, back, uh, mitochondria in cells are sort of like bacteria inside our cells, but the collective is selected for. And again, in multicellular organisms like humans and apples, the whole thing is selected for, which means all the cells in your body have one job, which is to work together to give rise to the next generation. There are some exceptions, like I don't know if you know, cancer in Tasmanian devils. They bite each other, it gets transmitted. It's been transmitted for hundreds of years by animals biting animals, and that's just a clonal um, lifestyle that they do. But of course, most things that we see in nature are not like that. And it's really about, in a multicellular organism, the germline is where you put all the potential for the next generation. So the whole collective is working together, and that's where selection operates. And that's where you have these sexual organisms with alleles that then will compete in a population, which is how I was taught about evolution. Happens here, not so much here. And then, of course, there are organisms that work, live in hives together, that work together. Of course, things like bees. But actually, I would argue, and maybe people, some people wouldn't like that, but actually human societies, we're tribal creatures. People will sacrifice their lives for their tribe, as we know, to the human cost. And that's because essentially tribes compete. And so again, there's a slightly higher level of selection operating, one could argue, definitely in case of things like ants and bees and termites. I recently saw the termite mounds in Australia, amazing. Um, so lots of, there are lots of cases where, again, selection's operating on a larger collective. So complexity, the origin of complexity are complicated. And actually, um, I'm not going to go into that detail, but there's People have argued recently, especially this guy Mike Lynch, whose work is worth reading, he's really argued that selection stops complexity rising, and, and complexity rises when there's no selection. So if you take two rich kids, put them in a basement together with a lot of money in affluent California, you might invent a new app or Facebook, something we don't need, but makes life more complicated rather than simpler. You know what I mean? Yeah, so life gets more complicated often when there's no selection. A lot of inventions in human, human culture, the Renaissance, there was the Black Death, a lot of people died. Then there were good years, there was abundant food, a smaller population, we had the Renaissance. No selection gives rise to complexity. Selection gives rise to simplicity. That's a simplistic way of putting it, but provoking, maybe. So let's get back to the story. So the thing that I've been interested in, in is how did cells get complex? So we know this is one event. You may disagree with some of the other things I said, but this event we know happened. Once upon a time on life on Earth, there was an event where one archaeal cell, which is simple in structure, organization, and one bacterial cell, which is simple in organization, got together to give rise to a complex cell, which gave rise to everything we see when we walk in the woods. Um, and this is a typical eukaryote. Uh, I love these pictures by Vickerman of a trypanosome. And essentially, every, every complex cell on the planet looks quite similar. A plant, a fungi. Under the microscope, they all look quite similar because they all have the same internal complexity. They have the same nucleus. They have the same ER, these, filled with these membrane compartments. They have mitochondria, um, all of them, which are bacterial cells living inside. They tend to have microtubules, they have peroxisomes, Golgi. All these things all you carrots have or had. So how do you go from two cells which are simple in terms of structure? So for example, bacteria tend to have one or two bounding membranes. These are the sketches of the first person to see bacteria on the planet, Leuven Hook. And this is a typical archaeal cell with one bounding membrane and a sugar coat, which uh, is typical of archaea. These simple, structurally simple cells, not, you know, their chemi chemistry is complex, but structurally simple cells gave rise to this monster, which is a typical eukaryote. How could that have happened? So before we get to how, let's think about when. So for most of life on Earth, for two billion years, there were only simple cells, we think, on Earth. And then around two billion years ago, the first complex cells arose. And some people think that that's related to the fact that cyanobacteria started pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. And so many archaea, for example, are anaerobic. And many bacteria can survive in aerobic conditions. So one idea is that by coming together, you enable these complex archaea 
to survive in areas where there's some oxygen and to use oxygen to generate more energy, because of course you burn carbon, hydrocarbons in oxygen, as we do when we fly in a plane or, or drive a car, or when we give a talk or listen to a talk, doing the same thing, you're burning hydrocarbons in oxygen, you release a lot of energy, which is why we can do stuff. So maybe the oxygen enabled these monstrous creatures to arise because they had the energy required to be big, be complex, and have large genomes and do amazing stuff. So something happened a long time ago. But so in my lab, and uh, we're experimental biologists, I'm an experimentalist. So one question you might ask is like, you're really just telling stories about the past. Like, how are we going to find out? Scientists should not be delving in the past. They should be doing experiments on stuff now. Otherwise, it's just speculation. And while that's sort of true, physicists all the time think about the past. So when you look through a telescope, of course, you are looking into the past, into the deep past. So through the Webb telescope, you're looking billions of years back in time. But even if you're not looking through a telescope and you're thinking about something like the Big Bang, do anybody not believe in the Big Bang? Everybody know what the Big Bang is? Yeah. yeah. So what, one reason we all think it's true is probably because people have told us there's evidence. So the evidence is that there are models out there that if there was a Big Bang, what would the universe look like? Well, there might be an echo of the bang. And cosmic background radiation, people think, is the sound of the echo of the Big Bang. So once you have a theory and you have data today, you can extrapolate back. Or the red shift, the fact that galaxies are moving apart, you can imagine extrapolate back in time and they came from a singularity, one spot. So science, you can do science in the past. You just need to think hard. You need models about how to extrapolate back in time. So can we do that in biology? And I'm not very good at it, but many biologists can, and it's called phylogenetics. When you study an evolutionary tree, what you're doing is you're taking DNA sequences from organisms that live today, and you're imagining, extrapolating back and saying, can I identify common ancestors? So the last eukaryotic common ancestor, what is, we kind of know what it's like because you can take all eukaryotes alive today and see what do they share, what did that common ancestor had. And because the sequence is so rich in information, it's almost impossible that that was um, the independent events. It looks like, it's like if somebody writes an essay and somebody else steals the essay, you can tell the plagiarism is clear. The plagiarism is clear between these. They're clearly using the same starting information to make a plant, an animal, a fungus, because the information is so similar. And similarly, you can, you can go back in time further and say, what do all, uh, all life on Earth share? And there are lots of things like ribosomes, ATPases, that all life on Earth share. So we really can infer things with high confidence back in time using phylogenetics. But we still want to understand, so we want to try and go back in time and think about the origin of eukaryotes. So I sort of argued that like the Big Bang, you sort of would be useful to have a model to think about if something happened a long time ago like this, what would it look like today? Can we sort of link today with the past? And that's why it's quite good to have a model. So if we have a model, we need it to explain some things about complex cells. So the first thing is that is the origin of the nucleus. And the reason that's a big deal is eukaryote means has a nucleus. So all eukaryotes have a nucleus, all of them, and bacteria and archaea don't. So that had to happen. That's, um, when did that happen? That's a key question. The other thing that happened is that all eukaryotes, complex cells today, have or had mitochondria. So when did that arise? Was it before or after the nucleus? We have to think about that. For me, one of the frustrations as a biologist when I was a student, and maybe for you, I don't know, is that people would show you a picture of a... In, in physics, you learn principles of how the universe works. In biology, they say, never mind the principles, learn the Krebs cycle and learn Golgi, ER, endoplasmic reticulum, peroxisome. So you just learn this stuff, and it makes no sense. Because nobody ever tells you, like, if you say, why does the eukaryotic cell secrete proteins into the ER, whereas bacteria and archaea secrete proteins at the plasma membrane, people say, you shouldn't ask why, you're a scientist, right? But to me, why is not such a bad question. As long as you say, why this way, why not another way? Because it's really worth thinking about how else things could be organized. That's a very good exercise as a scientist. So I think, for me, it's always been frustrating that we don't know why the cell is like it is. Part of that will be selection. It's a good engineering solution. And part of it will just be because that's what is inherited, because evolution is always a mixture of engineering and history. So if we have a history, a model of the history, at least maybe we can explain some of the structure. And there's a weird thing which I won't talk much about that you can ask about, is this lipid switch. So when you look at the, uh, a eukaryotic cell, a complex cell, its genome 
is basically part archaea-like and part bacterial-like. The archaea stuff is all the stuff like DNA replication, turning information in the DNA into proteins, the machines. So DNA, RNA, protein. But also the machines that traffic protein around cells. So all the stuff that organizes information flow is from archaea. Metabolism is from bacteria, but also all the membranes. So it's kind of weird that somehow an archaeal cell um, came together with a bacterial cell, but the lipids became bacterial. So why is that? And we can discuss that if you like. Um, and the other thing is we need gradual evolution because evolution, if it, if it was a flash of lightning and then a eukaryotic cell arose, then that's, we can't really apply logical thought to it. So we want to think about gradual evolution because that's you know, the way we can sort of do experiments and think about things. And in a way, you can think about the bicycle. You, know, you have these amazing sort of things with wheels and we can plot their history and you can see that they're, you, know, you can see what changed over time to give rise to these. So we'd like a model like that where you can understand something today by seeing the stepwise intermediates along the path. So I got thinking about this. Um, I was working mostly doing cancer research in flies and human cells. And I got thinking about this because of this guy. Um, so his name is David Baum. He's a plant biologist, which is why he's sitting in a tree, because he used to study, he used to photograph um, baobab flowers opening. He'd sit there for hours and hours waiting because they pop open <laughs> trying to catch them. Um, but he's a, he's a plant biologist. Um, and his surname, Baum, means tree. And he's in my family tree because he's my cousin. And so we were talking um, about family stuff, family tree stuff, but also the tree of life, because David's been thinking about that a long time. I don't know if you've heard this story before. <laughs> I've told it a few times. But basically, David told me that when he was an undergraduate, I think in his second year, he wrote an essay about the evolution of eukaryotes. And he read everything that he'd been told to. And he, and he heard this idea that a cell swallowed another cell, engulfed it, didn't digest it. And the non-digested the non cell became the mitochondria, and the, other, the rest of the cell became the, the rest of the cell, which is the host. And so he never liked that. And again, that's a typical um, old-style biology story where there's a dominant eater that tames and or you know, tries to kill another one, and, and there's a slave. And a, but actually, you, know, you look at the eukaryotic genome, it's half bacteria, half archaea. It's a, it's a collaboration. He gets as a collaboration. So he thought, in his essay, he wrote, what if, in the, in the cell, the nucleus is a sort of imprint of the ancestral archaeal cell. It's a bit naive, you know, <laughs> but maybe that is like an archaeal cell. And maybe the cytoplasm is kind of the new stuff, grew out, which is why we called it the inside-out model. And the bacterial partners were kind of sharing stuff and then slowly engulfed over a long period of time. So two partners learned to live with each other and over time became one a consortium. Um, I think he didn't get a very good mark, but many, many years later, he was telling me that he was thinking about revisiting it. And so he was telling me that, and I was like, stop. Like, this is too good. Can I work with you? And so together, we spent two years reading thousands of papers to see if there were any things that contradicted the idea or what supported it. And in 2014, we published a paper together, um, which was, I mean, I'm very proud of that because my mum's an artist and my dad was a scientist. So I always wanted to draw in a science paper. And this is just a paper with my drawings in. And so these are my drawings of like how you might have uh, gone from prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, to a eukaryote. And, and the key thing about the model was it's just simple and stepwise and explain topology. So there are lots of models out there of evolution of the eukaryotic cell, but this is a simple topological one. It tries to explain the structure of the cell. So the idea was that there were two cells living together in a biofilm, like in your gut, we have archaea and bacteria living together, and they were sharing resources to live better together. And to share better, we imagine that this sugar coat might have become thinner, enabling the cells to get even closer and share more intimately resources. And because they were sharing well, then to increase the surface area of contact, this cell, the protrusions grew and grew. And then if one of these protrusions went all the way around and pinched off, suddenly you trap these cells inside, which would become the mitochondria, and then you get a topologically separate plasma membrane, which then would hold them in. So that's a, that's a tricky event. But once you do that, um, you're in trouble if you haven't already worked out how to live together. Um, and you then seal off the ER, which is this space here, which becomes sealed off. So the, it's just a model. It's like an idea. But the, it, it, it has some nice features to it, which I was really struck by. So one of them is that um, 
I asked the question at the beginning, why do eukaryotes secrete proteins into the ER, not the plasma membrane? In the model, it's kind of obvious because this is the plasma membrane of the archaeal cell. That's where it secretes stuff. When you seal the ends, suddenly you get a new membrane, which is the plasma membrane. And in fact, in, in eukaryotes, the plasma membrane is different. The proteins on it are really different. Whereas in fact, the stuff in the middle are very similar across eukaryotes. Like the nucleus is the same in plants and animals. The outside, of course, is different. Animals are floppy, plants are stiff, right? So it's really obvious the outside is different. So, so um, that, that provides maybe an explanation for why this is still the site of protein secretion. And then, of course, you have to get things to the plasma membrane you trafficking. Also, when you do seal that thing, yeah, these bacteria suddenly become trapped and vertically inherited, which means the consortium is living together. So I don't know if uh, people have moved in together, but I think this is a bit like you need to learn to see whether you're going to be able to live together. Because once this happens, there's no going back. This is marriage with no divorce. Like, if these cells leave, the host is dead and, and the partner's dead. So basically, the two are completely dependent on each other. And to get to that point, it probably takes time. That was one of the ideas in the model. It takes time to get to really live together. And you have to remember that in this case, if this cell is secreting rubbish, it can diffuse away. If your mitochondria secrete stuff, it's secreting it into the cytoplasm, which is not a great idea unless you've learned to live together. So there are a few features of the model that we quite liked. Um, there might be things that you don't like, uh, but um, that's um, where it stood. And in a way, David and I probably both thought, I think I speak for him as well, we probably thought that we well, may never know. It's like a nice model. I think it's maybe the most parsimonious way of explaining cell organization. Other people think a lot about uh, metabolism. We didn't think about that. It's really about organization. And I think it's you know, the most parsimonious way of explaining the data. But it would have just stayed there. But we were lucky about timing. It's always good to be lucky with timing. Um, because in 2015, off the coast of Norway, between Iceland and Norway, at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, people were sampling DNA two kilometers down at the bottom of the sea, which was DNA fragments. And what they did is they collected them and, and, and assembled these metagenomes. And what they saw in the metagenomes is that they had a genome um, in some parts of the sediment where there were no eukaryotes, but there was an archaea that looked like a much closer relative to us than any archaea that was known, any prokaryote known. Um, and it was, it, was, it was found near Loki's castle, which is a deep sea vent two kilometers down. But in fact, it wasn't at the castle because there's a lot of life there. It was actually a place nearby where because the, this sort of, all this stuff gets spouted out of the bottom of the sea, this black smoke and stuff, when it precipitated, you get these uh, lines, sent lines in the sediment. So when they took a core, they could see the different layers and they could sample each layer. So in one of those layers, they found these genomes for the Asgards. Um, and they called them Asgards because it was near Locust Castle. Um, and so these archaea were, by ribosomal sequence, which is how most of these trees were done, following Carl Woese, who's this amazing scientist who was the guy who discovered archaea exist, um, it really put them next to eukaryotes. So we had a creature that was similar to us. And what was special about it, too, is it didn't just have a ribosome that was like our ribosome, but it had many things that we thought make it special. You know, humans always think we're special, but also eukaryotes always think they're special, all of us. And there are lots of things that we think eukaryotes make them special, like um, cytoskeleton. But in fact, these archaea have many things that were thought to be eukaryotic specific, like actin, escort, which are memory remodeling complexes, GTPases, which in our cells and eukaryotic cells control vesicle trafficking. They have GTPases, lots of them. So what do they do? We don't know. Um, Ubiquitin, which controls protein degradation, and things that control the cell cycle, how one cell becomes two. So they share a lot with us. The question is, though, it was just genome sequence, so what do they look like? So this was sampled from the bottom of the sea, two kilometers down. By the time it's up, there's nothing left. There's no cells, just DNA. And that begs the question, which we asked in this paper, is what does the cell look like? And for me, that's quite, it was a very interesting thing to write, because what we now know, which is kind of obvious, when you think about it, but again, it's not commonly known, that a DNA sequence does not code for a cell. The DNA sequence codes for how to make a cell grow twice as big and divide in two. It tells you how to make a cell from a cell. It doesn't tell you how to make a cell. So if you look at the genome of sequence of, a, of any organism, of us, a plant, an archaeal cell, one of these Asgard cells, and somebody asks you, how many membranes does it have? Where do you look? There is no code for 
membrane number because a cell with two membranes will make a big cell with two membranes, which will divide to give cells two cells with two membranes. A cell with one membrane will go twice as big to have one membrane, will divide to give rise to a cell with one membrane, two cells with one membrane. So lots of things are not coded for in the genome. So people who say, like, everything's in the genome, it's just wrong. Lots of things are not in the genome. But is there a way, I mean, could you build an AI tool that could figure out what ASCO looked like? And we tried to think hard about how to do that. One way, just to give you a clue we thought about, is that in a eukaryotic cell, a complex cell, it turns out that the plasma membrane, which is the new bit, I argued, has a different width to the ER. The ER is very thin and fluid, where you're making lipids. The plasma membrane is very stiff and thick because it's the boundary. And so proteins in the plasma membrane tend to have wide transmembrane domains, and an ER have thin ones. So we tried to look in the genome and say, do Asgards have two types of transmembrane domains, wide ones and thin ones? And the trouble is the data is not good enough, so we couldn't tell. Um, so this was uh, 2015. 2016, we still don't know what they look like. We had to wait until 2020 to see what they might look like. And so this was a group, Imachi Nobu found another sample off the coast of Japan, I think over a kilometer down at the bottom of the sea. They grew them under high pressure in these enormous, expensive, complicated equipment. Took them 12 years to culture them. And when they sequenced the sample, they realized what they had was Loki, another Ascaroche. And when they imaged them, what they saw were these cells with a cell body, beautiful protrusions. And in a way, most amazingly of all, these cells only live with partners. They can't live alone. They need a partner to take electrons, a metabolic partner. And so, of course, David and I were quite excited because this is exactly what my you know, hand-drawn sketches were kind of like, is that you have a cell with a cell body where the DNA is, a nascent cytoplasm where these protrusions are, where you exchange material with a partner you have to live with. So it doesn't mean it's true, but it was quite nice. Um, and that doesn't often happen in biology, <laughs> that for a while you, your prediction um, is borne out. Because again, evolution does all these complicated things without much logic. Um, but it turned out that that looks similar. And in 2023, there's another paper on the same organism where, um, again, these beautiful EMs of a low-key cell, an Ascolarchaeal cell, with a partner, with protrusions through which it's sharing resources or maybe, maybe also parasitizing, digesting another cell. We don't really know. And they stained it with uh, DNA and actin um, and showed that the DNA, the genome, is in the middle. And around it, are cytosthenol filaments, actin filaments, which probably fill the protrusions, which in our cells also control cell shape. So it looked really similar to our drawings, but also really similar to the way we think about, you might think about a simple eukaryote. So what it suggests is not necessarily that the model's correct, but it suggests that there might be things out there that might be a bit like other intermediates. So maybe we can find organisms like this in the oceans, maybe in our showers, maybe in the, you know, in the under the bathroom mat, you know, in our stomachs. They could be everywhere because we haven't really sampled life on Earth for these creatures. Uh, um, so um, it'll be fascinating to see in the future if we can find organisms like this. And we should do that before we destroy the planet. So it's another good reason to look after this amazing place. So my lab, we're interested again in thinking about origins of eukaryotes. But these cells, we have them in the lab now growing. They are in these anaerobic sort of bottles, so they grow without oxygen. They don't like oxygen. It looks like pond water. It's full of biofilm and tangled stuff with minerals. If you look under a microscope, they're all cells of different species there. We have some cultures now a bit pure, but they're super hard to work with. They grow slowly. They, they need partners. It's a bit of a mess. It's very hard to do cell biology. In the few years, we hope to be able to do that really well. But I had to sort of think, for as a scientist, experimentalist, what am I going to do? Like, I'm interested in origins of eukaryotes. I could try and look at what eukaryotes are like and try to make predictions and do experiments with eukaryotes. Ask God I can wait for, but what else could I do? And what I realized, for me anyway, one of the big conclusions was lots of biologists work on bacteria. Lots and lots of biologists work on eukaryotes. Almost nobody works on our care. So why don't we as a lab work on our care cell biology? Because we don't know how this happened, but some of the clues are bound to be here. So why not do archaeal cell biology? So this is too hard. So why don't we work on TAC, which are the, which are the cousins of our cousins, Asgard. So these, uh, these cells. So they're archaea that are experimentally tractable relatives of eukaryotes. And the thing that I was interested in, as you can probably tell from the way I introduced the whole topic, is that 
my lab has always worked on how one cell becomes two, because I think that's one of the profound problems in life on life. So this I call the IKEA model, and this is the Archaea model. Um, so if, if you want to build any object as a person, as a human, anything that's manufactured, we tend to, if you want to build two chairs, you get two kits, build two chairs. The way all life on Earth works is this amazing thing, where if you want to make two cells, you take one cell, you make it twice as big. Let's take a small chair, you make a big chair, and then you smash it to pieces and make two small chairs out of it in a very rapid process called cell division. And that's quite amazing, and that is really not well understood. So although many people for many years have studied cell division, it's really hard to understand how it works. And so we thought maybe by looking in Archaea, we can find some of the information about how cells do this that's relevant in eukaryotes today that have been missed because of all the complexity of this cell, which might be visible in this simple cell. Um, and it is a hard problem. So um, partly because the machinery that controls cell organization tends to be small. Proteins are small. Cells are huge, as I explained in the beginning. Cells are consortia with lots of different things. Also, there are very interesting problems. Like if you have one big cell, which is a sphere, and you want to make two small spheres, how, do, how can you do that? Any, is there a problem with that? Any physicists? What's the problem about making two small spheres from one big sphere? Yeah, the surface volume ratio has got to change. You don't have enough surface in this to make two cells. So either you have to make a lot of membrane or you have to shrink. So almost nobody has studied shrinking in cells, dynamic shrinking. But we think that maybe archaea shrink when they divide. So that's something we want to look at. So because they're a simple system, you can study things that may be important, which people haven't asked before, like surface volume ratio. So that's the most experimentally tractable archaea relative to us. The problem is, is that although it's the most experimentally tractable archaea relative, it comes from hot springs in Yellowstone National Park, which I went this summer to see. And they stink of sulfur. It's like hell. It's 75 degrees centigrade. Um, so it's kind of nightmare conditions we have to replicate in the lab. Also, the cells are one micron, really small. So it's too small for light microscopy and too big for EM. <laughs> like, why would you do it? You're crazy to do that. But, as I explained to you, I think there are reasons to work on Archaea, and this is the reason nobody works, has worked on them, but for me, there, was, there are lots of reasons to do so, which I sort of explained. So first of all, Archaea, as I said, are everywhere. They're one of the two domains of life, and new cats are half bacteria, half Archaea. They tend to be simple like bacteria, which means the machinery that they have, which we share, is often simple and easy to understand the fundamentals of how it works. Um, they share machinery with us partly because we have shared origins, so we can study machinery that's relevant to eukaryotes, but also that might give us clues about our origins. The other thing about archaea is they're also weird. So it's a bit like studying, in some aspects, like cells from another planet, like Mars. So for example, the membranes of archaea are just weird, completely different to bacteria and archaea. So sometimes, if you're a biologist interested in weird things like, you know, the peacock's tail, the, the, in a way, the, the, the lipids are an interesting case. There are lots of things in our care that are just amazing and just interesting. The other thing, of course, is that these are extremophiles. I mean, we think they're extremophiles. They think we're extremophiles. Because if you take a cell flow cell, put it at room temperature, it freaks out and freezes. So they find that very difficult. But um, we find their conditions difficult. But it's also interesting thinking about a uh, changing world. And what I've only realized working on cell flow is that is temperature is the most profound change you can do to an organism. Because when you change temperature, you change the kinetics of every reaction in the cell. You know, 10 degrees is doubling the rate of reaction. Also, when you change temperature, you change the material properties of membranes, RNA, proteins, all differently. So how everything goes out of whack, like it's really hard to do. So changing temperature is a really profound thing to do. And that's what we're doing to the planet. So Working on our care, I've really realized that temperature is a problem we should worry about. Um, but let's not worry about that now. Let's just um, see what we can do. So we thought it's worth, for these reasons, working on our care. So the first thing to do with cell biologists, we have to build a microscope that is mimicking a volcanic spring. Um, so a microscope costs, you know, a couple of hundred thousand pounds. Uh, so you have to be careful. And for years, we messed around being a bit careful. And we couldn't do it. And then this guy... Andre, who, as you can see, is completely fearless, figured out how to solve the problem. And the trick was, is we'd always been trying to heat the stage. So we'd have a little glass cover slip, a heated stage, and we would try to image cells on there. And they always died, Andre realized, of evaporation. Because what would happen is the water would evaporate over time, kill the cells. 
So he realized you have to heat the lid slightly hotter than the base. That was the trick. And that solved it, that one insight, which took us four years to realize. So basically, this beautiful thing, this is the mouse from a computer, like a, a ball in a mouse. It's quite small. There's a heating element here, um, which keeps the lid hot. The stage is hot, but not quite as hot. This is a bit hotter. We put a lens with oil, and you put a little uh, cover slip there, put the cells on top, and put an agar pad on there, and, and, oh, and suddenly you can, um, okay, well, Alice, Alice uh, is the one who did these movies. If you, if you add dyes to cells, you can start to see them divide. So we could have chambers that are 75 degrees centigrade or 90 degrees. We could hold them there and watch cells divide for the first time. Now, those of you seeing cell division will think this looks pretty boring, but it took us five years, so we were quite happy with this. Um, and I suppose, you know, you might have sort of said, and I am sort of said to myself, like, was this really worth it, <laughs> you know, risking my career for working on cell phallobus? But the reason I was quite excited straight away is that when we added DNA dye and membrane dye to cells, as somebody who's interested in cell division, what I saw really captivated me because these are cells which are very different to E. coli or ba other bacteria that have been described. Because when you watch cells divide, they they're one cell, the membrane starts to constrict, and in a period of about 10 minutes, the cell cuts in two. And at the same time, the DNA is going from one blob into two blobs as the cell's dividing. So it's a great system to study the biggest problem in cell division, which is how you make two cells with two bounding membranes and two bits of DNA, dealing with that surface volume ratio problem. So I thought, like, although it took a long time, it's a bit crazy, it's a bit hard, but actually it's exciting to try to do that. Just to point out, we have to use dyes still because GFP, the protein everybody used to image things in cells, unfolds at high temperature. So Chris in the lab recently evolved one that we think will work, but not quite yet, maybe in three months. Um, so we're still trying to solve that problem. But at least we could study cell division with a microscope. The other reason we were quite keen on looking at sulfalobus is because the Bernander group um, had previously shown, who should be acknowledged here, but Rolf Bernander's team showed that sulfalobus has a cell cycle, which means how one cell becomes two, a bit like a human cell. So as you may know, human cells are born in G1. Uh, there's a, it means just gap phase. They then make DNA, which is called S phase, to, be bit, to have a double genome. And then they separate the genome into two after a G2, a gap phase, a waiting phase. So they go born, wait, go into DNA replication, wait, go into division. And sulfalobus do exactly the same. They're born, they wait a bit, go into S phase, make DNA, go into uh, wait in G2 with two bits of DNA and then separate them and divide quite quickly. So it's very similar to a human cell cycle. And for me, that was kind of interesting because um, I'd spent my whole, year, whole career really studying the cell division cycle. And I worked um, in the lab of Paul Nurse, who's the guy who got the Nobel Prize for studying the cell cycle clock. And the cell cycle clock of all eukaryotes is driven by, anybody? Yeah, cyclin CDKs. And if you look at cyclin CDKs, eukaryotes have them, but Ascolocare and Sulfolobus don't. So they have a cell cycle clock, but the thing that we were taught is the clock, that Paul taught me is the clock, they don't have. So the question is, could there be an older clock, or could there be something else they do instead? And for me, that seemed quite a good problem. What we also noticed, actually, is that these cells not only have a cell cycle that's similar, but the, the machinery that controls the key events in the cycle are also similar. So in our cells, when you want to make DNA, you have two strands of DNA. You have to open it, called origin firing, to make more double-stranded DNA, to make two copies. The machinery that does that is actually conserved from eukaryotes to our care. Really similar. So they do that in the same way with the same machine. The machine that cuts cells in half, when you want to cut a cell in half, sulfalobus cell and a human cell, is the same as I'll talk about escort three. So the machine that does the work is old. The machines that do that were invented a long time ago and, and they're across life. The, the thing that's different is the regulation. So the regulatory machinery, like CDK cyclins, is actually new. Um, so how could, if these cells have a cell cycle, they don't have CDK cyclins, how might it be regulated in archaea? And one clue we had is that the thing that resets the clock in a eukaryotic cell is the reason cyclin is called cyclin is because cyclin cycles. That's why Tim Hunt called it cyclin. 
So it, it goes up as cell, cell gets older, and then when cells divide, it's destroyed by the proteolysis, by the thing called the proteasome. And that proteasome, that machine, actually is conserved from our care of eukaryotes. So we thought maybe, although the cell cycle machinery, CDK cycle, might not be conserved, maybe proteolysis is. And the reason I thought that, I quite like the idea, is because when you're making two cells, you're not just taking one cell and making two. You're taking one old cell and making two young cells. So, you know, the whole history of life on Earth, I've argued, is a, we're a colony, right? That means there's no aging. Although we age, the germline doesn't. The lineage on Earth doesn't. So you have to have an anti-aging system. So I sort of wondered whether the proteolysis might be a way that you make two young cells by destroying all the crap that builds up over time in a, in a, in a period. So we thought it's worth looking at the proteasome. When I say we, of course, I don't mean me, I mean Gabriel and Fred, who are in the lab, who decided to look at the role of the proteasome in our care. And what they were able to do is they showed that if you add a proteasome inhibitor cells, these are chaos cells, what happens is they can't divide, they stop, they build a ring of, of these escort proteins, which are the same proteins that in our cells form a ring that cut the division bridge. They form a beautiful ring, the DNA is separate, they can't cut and these accumulate over time. And so that suggested that just as in a human cell, this drug, bortezomib, which is an anti-cancer drug, which is used to kill cancer cells by arresting them in the cell cycle at division, will also act as a sort of anti-division drug in archaea, two billion years difference, um, by arresting them at the same point in the cycle. And so um, one problem with, um, we had to figure out, though, is why if escort 3, the CDVB protein, is a division machine, why these cells are unable to divide if they can't? degrade CDVB. And what we realized is that, in fact, archaea, like us, don't have one escort protein that cuts membranes. They have many. And the way they work is that this protein I talked about, CDVB, which is degraded here, assembles a ring, which then recruits another ring called CDVB1 and B2. Then it's degraded at this point, and that allows these other components to constrict and cut the cell in half. So it turns out that it works together with other ones to, to cut cells into. And, and you may not know that, but of course, in order, you know, everybody knows this, that if you want to do work, you have to need energy, right, to do any work. So the trouble is these escort filaments don't have any way to use energy. Most filaments have, a, have an enzyme activity where they can burn ATP or GTP to use energy to change shape, cell shape. These don't. But what they do is they use an ATPase called VPS4 to do that. And if you block the ATPase, they can't transition in state and you get these huge dumbbell cells, which are very beautiful, where they're stuck trying to divide, but they can't. And what was cool about that is that although we were working in Archaea, it turns out this is the best model, probably on the planet, I think, for studying escorts. Because in eukaryotes and humans, we have huge numbers of these proteins with very complex names that do the same thing. What they do is they, 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 you assemble a ring, which recruits another ring, and another ring, and another ring. And as you assemble the next ring, VPS4, ATPs will remove the previous one. So this one recruits this one, then this one, and then this one's disassembled. So just like we saw in Archaea, the same is happening in our cells to, 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 to allow these things to do work and change membranes. And so we have a picture of how things work now, where essentially sulfur lobus cells are used as escorts, which is related to the machine we use, to recruit other ones, which then cut cells in half. Um, and then when they enter the new cycle, they can fire their origins and repeat the cell cycle to do um, a whole cell cycle. And the proteasome is required to do this transition. The other thing I wanted to just touch on very briefly, um, which is something that Eloise worked a bit on, um, is essentially the other question of how do you coordinate DNA segregation and division, which is very important because if you get the axis wrong, so you separate DNA this way and put the ring this way, you'll get errors. So you have to make sure that you coordinate the two. So how does that work? So um, Joe, a PhD student at Lab and Alice, this is unpublished data. What they were doing is that uh, they image cells very carefully, DNA and membrane, now with a better microscope. And you can see that as cells start to constrict, the DNA is already separate. And they found that's always true. It's always true that the DNA separates first before the cell starts to cut, suggesting that the DNA separation maybe guides the ring position. But then what uh, Joe found, with also help from Louise, is that essentially um, we know that actually there are rings that form before the escort ring called CDVA, and this forms a ring. And when this forms a ring, um, the DNA is still in one blob, not two blobs. 
So essentially, we think that this ring forms first. That instructs the DNA to separate along this axis. So when you have A plus B, which is the CDBB, this escort protein, now the DNA is separating the right axis. And then the protosome fires to allow the cell to divide. So we think we figured out how that sort of works. So this is just a fleshed out model that you have an A ring that directs the DNA to separate this way. It recruits CDBB, B1 and B2 come, and then when everything is correct, the DNA is separate, then you degrade CDBB and the cell's cut in half. So we think we have a model of how it works. And these are the two control points. So the final thing I wanted to say, if I have a few minutes, yeah, is that um, also what we realized in this work, and this is the work of George up here, is that George showed that I've talked about how escorts in our cells and our chaos cells do similar things. But George found that when he looked in evolution, he found that actually everybody had escorts. Escorts is more like four billion years old. The last common ancestor of all life of bacteria and archaea had escort homologs. So escorts are really everywhere. And so what this suggests is that the tree of life that I showed before, where you have you know, um, eukaryotes inheriting stuff from archaea, is only part of the story. The truth is that the machines that do the work in cells are kind of the same in bacteria, archaea, everywhere across the tree of life. It's almost like you know, we have the same building materials, made bricks and glass and steel, that you used to build any small huts or you know, a, a building of any size. And all the cathedrals and the big buildings, the office buildings, they're built with the same materials, just the way you put them together is more complex. So what's happened over evolutionary time, complexity is complexity of regulation, but the building blocks are really, really old, four billion years old. So that's, I think, a sort of picture of the life on Earth. And so what are we going to do for the future? So one thing I just wanted to say is that um, what we'd love to know in the lab is that sulfur loba cells um, are individual cells. They live alone. They actually kill other species, related species, by screening toxins. They're kind of, they are survivor of the fittest machines. They have lean genomes. They're mean and lean. But during evolution, as I've sort of argued, there's a transition where cells start to share resources. So we'd love to know what are the rules for organisms coming together instead of stealing from each other, they start to share. And maybe by looking at other organisms like Ethnococcus or Archaea, and maybe organisms like this, we can start to study the rules that enable cells to come together and to work together and live as cooperatives. And if we can find that out, maybe that will help us on Earth be less competitive because some things like climate change we need to work together to solve. And we'd love to find some organisms like that to sort of help us with that. And of course, everything I've shown you is a collaborative effort of people working together for a common goal, which is what a lab is. And that's why it's such a pleasure to be part of a lab. I love having a lab because people are working on their own project, but we have a kind of common goal. And um, that's a consortium, the group, people doing things together. And thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Baum, for your fascinating talk. We have time for maybe a couple of questions from the floor if anyone has questions. Yes, catch. <laughs> um, hi, thank you very much for the very informative talk. And I'm actually, yeah, I'm actually just quite interested in the topics in those symbiosis. And I'm quite happy you mentioned, like, well, one, uh, like, one thing, like, um, uh, mostly curious about, which is the uh, lipid switch. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, I, I, I know that, like, um, so uh, modern eukaryotic cells, they have, like, fatty acid, acids, uh, yeah. like, based membranes, just like all the bacteria, yep. while, like, the nucleus might have some archaea elements in it. But, so, I, I'm, I'm very curious what if, like, if a eukaryotic cell arise from a cooperation between bacteria and archaea, why do we not see any eukaryotic cell with a major archaea membrane component? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, because some, some theories say like maybe selection just selects yeah. for the bacterial membrane, but yeah. you see like archaea membrane actually do just fine in like yeah. the same environment as bacterial membrane. Yeah, no, so. it's a great it's a great question. I mean, one thing one thing I think our work shows is that. For example, escorts, we share with, um, with our care. They use the same machinery as we do to, to form rem um, remodel membranes. So one thing you should remember is that that's an archaea using escort to remodel archaeal membranes, and we use it to model bacterial membranes. And for example, the translicon, the way you secrete proteins, the machine comes from archaea, 
where it works in our cow membranes. In our cells, it works with bacterial membranes. So one thing that's really important to realize is that actually, although people talk about the lipid divide, the same machines from our care can work in either bacterial lipids or eukaryotic lipids. So I think it's not such a big problem, but it, but it, is, but it is to explain how it happened, it is important. And I think one thing archaeal lipids are not good at is archaeal lipids, the reason, for example, sulfolobus has a monolayer, not a bilayer, mostly. And that's because it lives at high temperature and doesn't have a wall. So it needs to be quite stable, the membrane, and also support a big pH difference. And so that's why archaeal lipids are very good. They're not very good for membrane remodeling and for doing vesicle trafficking. So we, one thing we argued in, our, in the original paper is that you need to sort of if you want to do vesicle trafficking and control, for example, the, the size of this plasma membrane and the size of ER Golgi in, in relation to each other, you need membrane fluidity, and that comes from bacteria. So the alchemists tend not to be so fluid. So we'd argue there is a selective pressure, fluidity, that encourages bacterial switch. But actually, the lipids themselves, the width is the same, the head groups are similar in terms of charge, there's lots of things about the membranes that are quite similar between bacteria and archaea. So though people make a big deal of it, the cells don't care so much, actually. The proteins don't care so much. Yeah. Thanks, though. Good right, question. Thank you. Uh, we can take one more question, I think. OK, uh, another switch from archaea to eukaryotes. Yep. Uh, and what would kind of interest me would be the genome structure. Yeah. Because in archaea, you have Circular chromosomes, yeah. as far as I'm aware, and in eukaryote you have linear chromosomes, and this doesn't really fit with the selection only produces simplicity, as far as I see it, unless there's another yeah. event that can explain that switch. No, well, it, I mean, I think that's a good example of where, so the big transition between procats and, and, and eukaryotes, one of the big things is genome size, and I think we don't know, but bacteria and archaea tend to have small genomes, like a couple of megabases, and eukaryotes tend to have genomes 10, 100 times, 1,000 times bigger. They also tend, archaea and bacteria have circular you know, chromosomes, and, and eukaryotes tend to have multiple copies of linear chromosomes. So one idea might be is that to have so much DNA, you need to somehow not be a circle or closed circles, maybe get entangled, I don't know. But, um, but clearly something very strange happened in the, in, the, in the transition. And although there aren't that many more genes, which I think shocked people, you know, when we did the Human Genome Project, people were shocked that we're not that much more complicated in terms of gene number than E. coli, that we feel much more complicated. But actually, of course, the regulation is much more complicated. So we have much bigger genes, many more alternative splicing, many more unstructured domains and proteins that serve as sites of regulation. So, um, so there's lots of maybe unnecessary complexities. That's why I would argue maybe the first few carrots, there was this bottleneck, no, no selection. I don't know if you know this, but the key thing about selection is you need a high population number. If you go through a bottleneck with small numbers of organisms, selection disappears and you get accumulation of stuff. So it really might be that genome size and all these things that we, we don't understand, maybe they arose during that period of eukatogenesis. Um, that's not really answering the question, though. Mm -hmm. It just means, again... We, we don't know how the transition happened. But of course, that is one of the profound things that changed, as did many other things. Um, well, yeah, so I think we will probably okay. cut off questions there in the interest of time. But thank you, Dr. Baum, for thank your you. really fascinating talk about our closest living relatives, or living or dead or alive relatives. And thank you, everyone, for coming down this week for our first SciSoc talk. Next week on Tuesday, also at this venue, is another talk by another scientist from the Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And this time it will be on tools to study mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we hope to see you all there and we hope you enjoyed the talk today.